in the house of the Lord. Amen. We are gathering on the eve of the birth of our Savior, and we have the opportunity to come and worship in freedom. A lot of places don't have that. You go to China, they can't gather in freedom and worship as we do. But we can lift our voices and praise God for the gift that He has given us. So let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer, and we're going to prepare our hearts for Sunday school. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, Lord, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, as that he may move in our own lives, picking out the good and the bad, that we may be even farther transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ, Lord, that the mind of God, Christ might be in us, and the heart of God might be instilled in us, afresh and anew, that we may be more like Jesus every single day. We pray, Lord, that you just anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they lead us in songs you have us. May our hearts and our minds be prepared that they be good soil for your word to follow, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would be able to uh, that our hearts will be plowed as well, and we may apply it to our lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The children may be dismissed to Sunday school. I know Sister Tina's back there. Yeah. They're all there. They're all there. Okay. Good news. Yeah. So the children may be dismissed to Sunday school. Yeah. yeah. Where does Tina go? What? You should go to the No. She's usually downstairs. Usually downstairs. I'm all confused, so Merry Christmas and have a happy time finding your Sunday school class. And I'm going to move this before I blast everybody out. Let's see what's going on. But with all that being said, we are gathered on the eve of our birth of Jesus Christ. And surprise, surprise, what are we learning about in Sunday school? We're learning about the Nativity. I know, shock, we do that every Christmas. We focus on the birth of Christ. We've look, been looking at a more in-depth study of Mary, Joseph, and the Nativity, finding out more specifics, going a little bit more in-depth. And what we, just, what we discovered was we started by looking at Mary, who was the most prominent parent of Jesus. And why was she the most prominent parent of Jesus? Most prominent what? Prominent parent. Why is she the most important one in Scripture? Why is she the most prominent? Why is she the one that sticks out in everybody's mind? Well, the man can't have a child. man can't have a child. And there's a two-part question to that. So what's the last one? What do we know about Joseph? He died at some point in the life of Christ. So we find Scripture referencing Mary more than we do Joseph because when it focuses on his earthly ministry, Joseph's not around. So who's going to be the parent that's mentioned more often? Mary. Because there's not much other option there. If she's the only one around, it's the one that Scripture mentions. Before I get too far ahead and I forget, there are notes for today back there on the communion table. Um, we'll probably be starting them here in a little bit. Also, if I forget, as you leave Sunday school, there are is lofty eyes back there. Merry Christmas. Take two if you like. I know the women are all excited about that. But we've been looking at Mary, we looked at Joseph, we looked at the age, we looked at genealogy, we looked at um, the death of Joseph possibly being between the age of Jesus, of Jesus being between the age of 12 and 30, because of the absence there. And now we're back to the point. <coughs> and we also mentioned the fact that we do not find the death of Joseph's the death date of Joseph mentioned anywhere in history or any significant historical records, and we looked at that, and the reason being is probably because of his social status. He was poor. Now, why would you document the death of a poor person? If it would have been king or pharaoh, that would have been a different story. It would have been significant. But Mary and Joseph were poor. Now we're continuing on with lessons learned from Joseph. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 through 24, Ms. Olin, please read that. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 24.
Oh. Yes. Brother Eli, you want to collect all? I did my best not to forget anything and I forgot it. Okay. And if they don't, give us a shake of that. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm just trying to see.
He didn't say, okay, I, God, I need you to prove it to me again. Give me another angel. Send me another sign. But rather, he went and did as the voice of God commanded him through the uh, message of the angel. And the next thing I see with Joseph is found in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 19. Matthew 1 and 19. So the Bible states that Joseph was a just man. You know, he knew what the angel of the Lord told him to do, but he did not make her a public example. You know, he didn't say, Mary, go out on the streets every day, let everybody know you're pregnant, because we know that back in that day, if you were married out of wedlock or you had a child out of married out of wedlock, that didn't make sense. But if you had a child out of wedlock, that was punishable by stone. But Joseph was just. He knew what God had told him. He knew that she was bearing the Messiah. And because of that, he put her away privately. He didn't make a public example of her. He didn't go and put her in harm's way. He kept her protected. Now, how many of us could the Bible record that we are just? You know, that we did things according to the word of the Lord, and we were careful about them. You know, there are things that even when it comes to the house of God, we become so accustomed to that we just take them for granted. Uh, I think it was during the time of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas that the things of the Lord weren't as precious as they were. I mean, they were committing all kinds of abominations in the temple. They took the things of God for granted. You know, we need to be careful that we don't take the things of God for granted as well. That we can be classified as just in God's eyes. That we're not out to do and put on a show for the world or make a big old to-do, but rather that we need to take the things of God serious. When the Word of God says something, we apply it to our hearts. When somebody comes to us in confidence and saying, pray for me, I need help in this area, we don't even go and blab it to the whole church. You know, it's one thing if they wanted it prayer for the whole church. There are some things that are in confidence. Just like if there would be something that went on in this church that would be a big to-do, it would involve a big church, you know, maybe a scandal. That's not the church's down the road's business. They don't need to be what's going on. We'll take care of it. If the church down the road is having a scandal, guess what? It's not your business to go and try and find out the dirt on their church either. We need to make sure that we are keeping ourselves just. We are making sure that we're keeping ourselves pure. We're doing what is right in God's eyes in our lives. And then we're going to move on today. And talk about the wise men a little bit. When we look at the wise men, they come, the term that we use for wise men comes from the Greek word magus. And the meaning of it is a foreign origin, a magician, an oriental scientist, by implication, a magician, sorcerer, or wise man. As we study them out, of course, we will realize that they're not a magician, they're not a sorcerer, but rather they were more wise men or astronomers. They are only found in one passage in the entire New Testament, and that is found in Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12. We're not going to read that for the sake of time. But if someone does find Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, let's go ahead and read that. Matthew 2 and verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, So where do they come from? In the east. In the east. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So, well, I guess we'll talk about it now. So we've been again looking at their nationality. What was their nationality? Well, if they came from the east, they probably would have came from the Babylonian region. They might have been Persian. Most believe that they were Persian. But they might have had Jewish ancestry. <laughs> they might have had Jewish ancestry somewhere in the bluffs. Why? Because they were aware of the scriptures. So they might have had that possibility. When we look at their social class or their wealth, what was their social class? We know Mary and Joseph were poor. Where do the wise men fit into this? They were rich. They were wealthy. How do we know that they were rich and wealthy? Just by a quick question. The gifts they brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
expensive spices. So they were wealthy, they were to do. And if we want to find their country, and as mentioned in scripture, we know they came from the east, so the best we can do is, at this point, they come, came somewhere east of Jerusalem, or somewhere east of Bethlehem. And when we look at their occupation, it would have been more or less astrologers. And not astrologers as we think of today, those that read the signs in the sky and yada, yada, yada. But rather they would have been an astronomer, someone who studied the stars, someone that was familiar with them. What are the names of the wise men? We do not know. Bible does not mention their names at all. Scripture is silent on that topic. When we look at the names of the wise men, you want to take a guess from where they came from? They came from the apocryphal Armenian gospel, book, I should say book, gospel of the infancy, which is not part of the Bible. And we've already talked about books when it comes to the Apocrypha to begin with. They were not accepted as part of the Bible, but rather the name itself means fallacy or false teaching. <coughs> How many wise men came from the East? It doesn't say. So we don't know their names. We don't know how many wives we came from the East. The reason that we believe, oh, the only way that people come up with three wise men is because they come from the names that are taken from the false book of the Apocrypha, the Armenian Gospel of the Infancy. I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but once again, there's three names mentioned, so they assume three wise men. But when we look at the true word of God, it's silent on it. Scripture does not state the names of the wise men. It does not state how many wise men came from the east. All it states is that wise men came from the east. And since it says men and not man, it was more than one. When we look at the wise men, Matthew is the only one who records their coming or anything about the wise men at all. Everything that we know about them is taken from that passage in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. As we've already said, considering that they came from the east, they were Gentiles, or could have been Gentiles, or they were Jewish remnants left over in Babylon, or they were Gentiles that had Jewish blood mixed into um, their system. When you study it out, a lot of people believe that they were actually Persians. When we look at the Greek word for magi, it's translated uh, using the word magi or magus, M-A-G-O-S, and it means a foreign, a magician, oriental <coughs> scientist. And when we look at it, even though we sing we three kings of Orient or, we really know that they really weren't kings. They just had a high status. They were astronomers. They would not have been kings at all, but rather, once again, the idea that they were kings is taken from the apocryphal book, the embassy of, and i got to go back to some nation, the gospel of the infancy. And it is reinforced by the Christmas carol, We Three Kings, which, by the way, was written in... 1863 by John Henry Jopkins, Jr. for a Christmas play at General Theological Seminary in New York. He was a deacon in the Episcopal Church, and he was later a rector at Christ Episcopal Church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So that song hits a little bit closer to home than we realize. But once again, they were not kings. It was taken from a false book, and it was backed up by the idea of the Christmas song, We Three Kings. When we look at that word magi, it is used in five verses of the New Testament. Three out of the five times it is referring to the wise men of Matthew chapter 2. 
The other times he is referring to sorcerers. We find that in Acts chapter 13 and 6 and 13 8. If someone would, would, would please read Acts 13, 6 and verse 8. Those two verses. Sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. 
And when he had found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, took the king and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced and were with exceedingly great joy. And they were coming to the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God and dreamed that they should not return to Herod, they departed into the country another way. And right after that, we find that the angel appeared unto Joseph. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and flee into Egypt. So apparently the wise men visited Jesus while he was still in Bethlehem. <coughs> and it had been after the temple dedication of Jesus, because Mary and Joseph offered fertile doves, indicating that they were not received they had not yet received the gifts of the wife. Remember what we said about the gift of being two, of two turtle doves in the past? That indicated their social status. They were poor. Well, upon receiving the, these gifts, guess what happened to their social status, whether or not other people realized it? Their wealth went up. Which means they would have had to give more to God. Because God still requires our 10%. But they would have, their gift giving would have went up. So apparently the wise men visited within the first eight days. Also, we know that Herod was still alive, alive during this time, so they would have arrived somewhere between 6 and 4 BC. Now, what are some lessons that we can learn from the wise men? Once again, they fall in the same category as Joseph and Mary did with that first great lesson that we can learn. They had faith. They had faith because they had to follow a star. And guess where they got the information from that star to follow it? You think an angel appeared unto them? They, they got their information. Well, they saw the star in the sky, but how did they know to follow that star? Because so they were studying the star. They were studying the stars, but still they had to have some information somewhere to pull from. And then they knew the scriptures themselves. What's that, brother? And then they knew the scriptures themselves. Which means they would have had to pull their information from written sources. <coughs> More than likely, the wise men had to pull their, their information to follow that star from a red source. They didn't have an angel, more than likely, they didn't have an angel appear unto them. More than likely, it, they did not have the experience of the shepherds. A whole host of angels did not appear unto them. But rather, they went on writing. What takes more faith? To follow the instruction from an angel, something supernatural that appeared before you? To follow the instruction of an angel that's backed up with a heavenly host, multitudes and multitudes of angels. Or does it take greater faith to follow something that was just written down? Reading. Reading the word of God. When we look at the wise men, they had great faith. And considering that they came from the east, they might not have had all the writings that the Jews had. What writings might they have had if they came from the East? Well, they didn't know how to read the stars. Well, they didn't it, but they had to get the writing somewhere, brother. And, and seeing that one star that was divided by anything else, it, it made them curious. It made them curious, but they still would have had to get information somewhere else. Who would they have been able to read after? Who would have been in the East? Or why would there have been Jewish writings in the East? Let's start there. Well, now the disciples, we're talking hundreds of years before their time. How would Jewish writings have gone to the East? The scriptures. I mean, they had to have something. Yeah, but how did the scriptures get there? Excuse me? How did the scriptures get there? I'm pulling now. Something we haven't talked about or touched on for a very long time. 
the Babylonian captivity. All the Jews were taken from their homeland to Babylon to the east, to the area of the Medes.